I'm delighted to introduce David Sirota here. And uh, climate change is, is many things. And until recently, it was not hilarious. Uh, but your work has sort of challenged that. And um, uh, you look at the cast uh, uh, that is in the movie, the people who are behind it. Uh, I, I don't know whether to ask, like, how did this movie get made, or how did this movie not get made, given the like passions and, and, and personalities involved. For I mean, how did it not get made for for so long? How did this movie get made? Um, sometimes I wonder that, <laughs> uh, because the storyline is. Um, I mean, the way the movie ends. Uh, hopefully, lots of people have seen the movie. The way the uh, the way the movie ends was. Um, we were, we were a little bit nervous about the way the movie was going to end, um, uh, in the sense of how would people react to it. Um, I can say that um, from the beginning when we started coming up with this idea, I was skeptical that it would ever actually get made. Uh, Adam McKay, um, the director uh, and screenwriter of the movie, um, you know, when we were spitballing the first ideas, he was really excited about it, but I was sort of like, yeah, I mean, it would be great if this movie got made, but I don't think a movie that necessarily has this message is actually going to find a place to be made. And to his credit, I mean, he used his position in Hollywood to push it forward, and then a number of the cast members who have a huge amount of influence and, and, and can get things made, uh, particularly uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio, I mean, they, they signed on really early, and then it was kind of off to the races. So mm -hmm. I, I've said this before, I'll say it again, I, I, I am so grateful that they used their influence uh, to make a movie, by the way, a movie that I think was going to inherently be not a consensus movie, it was going to be a, 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 a controversial movie, and I think um, a lot of people in their positions sometimes want to be risk averse. So I really appreciate that they actually use their star power to do something that they knew would create a lot of discussion, positive and negative. So I mean, it's a it's a ancient question, like what is art about? Is it like what comes first, the message or the story? And like, wh how does that apply here? What came first, the mission or the message? Or the, I'm sorry, the message or the story? Well, it was, it was um, after the movie Vice, uh, Adam McKay's movie about uh, Dick Cheney, came out. He and I were, were talking, and I said, you know, you really have to use your, um, your special talent for mixing politics and comedy for something about the climate crisis. And he said, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about how to do that, and I, I, I just haven't been able to figure out what, uh, how to do that. I don't want to do a kind of Mad Max, post-apocalyptic, uh, movie showing a kind of hellscape uh, on Earth. I want to do so. But so how do I, how do we actually do this? And a couple of weeks later, I had written something uh, about the climate crisis, reported something, and I, I said, you know, I'm, I don't know why these these stories they don't land. Why don't they, you know, why don't they have more uh, cultural and political impact? And I said, it kind of feels like an asteroid is headed towards Earth, and nobody cares. And a couple of days later, he said, you know, I haven't been able to really stop thinking about that idea. I wonder if, like, that's the movie. And then we started spitballing scenes and the <laughs> like, and here we are. I, so I guess that's a long way of saying I think the, the message came first. That he, he was, and I think a lot of people, were looking for a way to, to tell a, a piece of the story of climate change, and, and we kind of stumbled into it. And so did it land, and who did it land with, and what did you imagine the impact would be? Like, is, can you draw a line from this movie to anything anyone has done to, to you know, to fight climate change, forward policy, whatever the, uh, whatever the activity might be? So I definitely think it landed in the sense that I haven't, like, like, I've been involved in two things that had, I would say, above 95% cultural recognition. I was involved in the Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign as his speechwriter, and every single person in America, I think, basically knew who Bernie Sanders was. So you could, you know, if, you, if that came up in conversation, everybody would know that. And then this movie, I think, 
I'm not. I don't know if most people have seen it, but certainly it's got a name ID of of you know lots of people know it. I mean, I I, I didn't realize that by the way until I was I was um I was in a UPS store and I was mailing a poster to somebody from the movie. I think I was mailing a poster to my to my parents, and as I I couldn't get the poster in the roll, and I kind of took it out in the middle of the store and like everybody in the store got all excited mm. about, you know, well, you were involved in that movie. So it was like, wow, this movie really gotten out there. So I think, yes, I think it landed. And I think when you see politicians, when you see the media refer to the phrase, don't look up or a play on that, it, they're referring to it as shorthand for something that, um, that it means that they know that everybody knows what it is. Did has the movie made, you know, impact, pun intended or no pun intended? Um, I think, I guess I think, um, you know, I think, I think, look, uh, there was a, a march in France where 80,000 people came out for the Just Look Up rally. I think, um, I guess I would say this, there's no specific policy in the movie that, that the movie is prescribing. The movie's impact is to try to grab the culture by the lapels and say, we have a serious communication problem here. So I would like to believe that the movie is, is the impact is hopefully psychological. Like, and, and, and to be clear, I think lots of people saw the movie as a, as a pandemic uh, uh, allegory. And I think ultimately at the, at the base of the movie, the movie is actually about whether we can, as a society, process in a constructive way verified science. Or are we, so, are we so captured by a political war, a cultural war, a media war, that facts are now just in service of those wars, hmm. as opposed to things that we act upon? And I actually think that's why the movie um, did so well, because I think whatever your position on what we should do about the climate crisis is, or whatever your position about what we should do, uh, should have done about the pandemic, I think you can, hopefully most people can recognize the fundamental truths in the movie about our broken system of communication. There's, uh, there's a real, as absurd as it is, it's idly curious in the room how many people have, have seen Don't Look Up. Uh, a fair number of people have seen it. Um, and, and one of the things that stayed with me and that I think about quite frequently is, is how absolutely absurd every last thing is. Um, <laughs> obviously, I mean, it was, I think, the point. Um, but also, there's this very real psychological realism that still gets through. And there's, there's a scene where uh, a, a very top-ranking army general um, goes and gets chips for the main characters and charges them $10 yeah. for snacks. Yeah. And, um, and that in itself is absurd, but like three quarters of the movie later, um, the characters are still like, the comet is bearing down on Earth. They can look up and see it. Yeah. And she's still laying on the roof thinking, why did he charge for free snacks? Yeah. And it's just like. People um, love that joke, though, by the way. That, that people love that joke. Yeah. It's because like e even the, the person at the heart of the drama who brought this risk to everyone's attention is still so trapped in her Neolithic brain that um, she just can't figure out the snacks, even though, you know, you're going to die and you're going to die and you're going to die. <laughs> um, and I, I think the question there is, um, you know, climate people, whether they're activists or, or corporates or government people, are more tightly wrapped around how to talk about climate change than just about like anybody in any other field of life. Um, and I wondered how uh, a movie that's so unconventional, like both adhered to um, and rejected, you know, these, these obsessive level struggles that people have every day to figure out how to talk about climate change, like what worked, what didn't work, you know, what could you make fun of, what couldn't you make fun of because it turns out, well, that's actually kind of a serious thing. The reason, I mean, Everybody can see what they want to see in the movie, and why do we put different things in the movie? And I, I look at the general joke um, as a way to acknowledge, as us, the 
makers of the film that we are all in this bubble. That we, that in other words, it, the movie is not saying, you know, we the filmmakers are better than the viewers or that uh, the public uh, is somehow stupid. It's to acknowledge the fact that even if we are mindful of the crises in front of us, we are all still in this bubble. And I think acknowledging that, I, I mean, as from a viewer experience, I think it kind of takes the edge off, right? I mean, it's like, hey, we're, we're in this too. I mean, there's another scene where the uh, Dr. Oglethorpe is watching them on morning television, uh, and he, he's you know, waiting for them to say the comet is headed towards Earth, and yet he's also momentarily getting into this ridiculous drama between the rapper and the singer, and he's excited about it too, which is to say even the person in the middle of the, the scientist who's in the middle of the, of the crisis is also a human being. And I, I think acknowledging that, I think acknowledges the, the human condition, but I also think we can acknowledge that, that we shouldn't be consumed by that. That shouldn't be the be all end all. And I hope the movie, you know, one of the takeaways from the movie is that distractions uh, are a normal part of, of the human experience. Uh, enjoyment, jokes, um, little petty human interactions, that's all uh, part of, of life, but we shouldn't be uh, that shouldn't become the only thing we focus on. And, and one other point on the, on the general. I think the other takeaway from that joke, and again, th this is a joke that almost every conversation about the movie, people just love that joke. I also think it's a reminder of, and I can say this having worked on campaigns and, and the like, and we have this idea of these people at the top of the political hierarchy. They're so powerful. I mean, there's this sort of a deification of these people. And it's also a reminder that they're all just people. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I say that, um, you know, as I said, I work for the Bernie Sanders campaign, and I can tell you, having spent a lot of time with that candidate, it is really true. They are all just people. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the metaphor is, is obviously very powerful, very potent. I wanted to explore it a little bit because it's not uh, it, it's not an identity, it's a metaphor. And there's important ways where climate change is different than a comet. And probably the most important one is there's a deadline. Like, it's going to hit. There's no, um, there's no impact with climate change on a global scale. Uh, and in, in particular, I, I think that the overall message has been muddled in the last few years because they're just to like geek out for a second, you know, there's this notion of the carbon budget and we're running out of time. We, there's only so much more carbon we can fit in the sky and there's, you know, like there's 10 years left. Like it's, it's incorrect to say there's, there's 10 years left, there's 12 years left. You know, there are countdown clocks that um, probably serve activist purposes, but uh, again, don't withstand factual scrutiny. And I wondered if there's, did you feel any conflict between the metaphor and climate science, either in that particular way or in a, any other way that comes to mind? Um, I think the, look, I've seen some, some, you know, some film criticism, oh, the metaphor is not perfect, and my first response to that is, you're right, it's, it's not perfect, it's, it's a metaphor. Like, that's, that, it, it is a metaphor. So the, I think the question then becomes, well, what is the metaphor trying to dramatize? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, if you're using a metaphor, it's, it's like, you're right, Something that's not climate change is not climate change, right? I agree with that. No, everything so, is climate so, change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so what we were, what I think the metaphor serves as, it, it speeds up time in comparison to climate change. And I agree with you, obviously, that climate change, there's not one singular explosive impact. So we're trying to dramatize both the uh, time scale and also uh, the cumulative impact in one instant in order to um, spotlight how irrational our response is to it. Because, yeah, sure, uh, if runaway climate change goes on for 300 years, uh, you know, maybe the earth isn't going to, you know, literally blow up, but the earth in theory will be not all that habitable at all, right? And so our, we said, let's, let's 
shorten the time frame to six months, and let's have it actually explode to, to allow viewers to focus the mind on, okay, our response to something that we know is going to happen maybe on a longer time scale, maybe not with one singular explosion, our response is irrational and problematic. Hmm. Was there anything left on the floor that you were like, oh, I wish, I wish this long movie was even longer? Uh, you know, to be honest, I, I, um, I, I wanted a little bit more um, of like a, a government shutdown that would prevent, you know, Congress squabbling, that would prevent a response to the, to the asteroid, uh, the comet. Um, uh, there was something that was being debated whether to keep in or not. It was one of my pet points, which was the, um, the movie inside of the movie, uh, Total Devastation. Uh, which I think was us, Hollywood, essentially us making fun of itself, like scheduling a movie about an asteroid hitting Earth to come out on the day that the asteroid, the actual asteroid, was going to hit the Earth. <laughs> like, so I had to really, I fought for that to be, you know, kept in. Uh, and, and we got a great cameo from, um, uh, from one of the most famous actors in the world. Um, and, and frankly, I, I actually would have liked to have seen more, uh, th before I say this, there's a big debate, I think, among people. Is the president a Democrat? Is it a Republican? You know, it's kind of hilarious. I mean, I've been accused of, oh, you guys created a Hillary Clinton character just to bash Hillary Clinton. Oh, you created Donald Trump to, you know, bash Donald Trump. And, you know, at first I was like, uh, I was kind of frustrated by that. But then I realized, look, it's, it, if you're confused whether it's Clinton, Trump, or some other politician you like, it's an amalgam of politicians. That said, I would have liked to have seen, um, uh, and Adam and I have talked about this, like if there was more time in the movie, like uh, how the opposition party would mm -hmm. react to the way the president behaved. Uh, and I, you see it for one second where the, the senator says, um, you know, we're going to hold censure hearings on this ridiculous Supreme Court, but I would have, uh, court nominee, I, I would have liked to have seen more about how feckless the likely congressional response would have been as a metaphor for the way Congress and the president uh, deal with each other. And it's too often, in my view, Congress defers to the president mm -hmm. on things like this. Where did your critics surprise you and where were they right? Um, I think the surprising thing to me about some of the criticism was that well, one that you know, it wasn't. A, it's not a perfect metaphor. I'm like, I, you know, that I I don't even know how to. Re it's just, just it's kind of annoying. It's like it's not supposed to. It's not a perfect metaphor. So that that was kind of surprising. There was a there was a um, a moment in some, when the first when the movie came out where um, Adam McKay had said something to the effect of, "Listen, I'm glad that there's a big debate about this uh, uh, this movie." I, and he said something to the effect of, you know, I will, I will say, if, if you don't think climate is a problem at all, I'm not sure you're going to fully appreciate the movie. And that was twisted in a really nasty, dishonest way to portray him and us as saying, if you don't like our movie, you must be a climate denier, which of course is ridiculous. We would never say that. Like people have a right to like or hate our movie and also that's not a reflection of whether you um, uh, believe in climate science or not. I think the thing that was, I guess, I guess it shouldn't be surprising to me, but it, it almost felt like we were in the movie itself in the way the movie distorts reality. And you see that this distortion of reality that you can say one thing and then it can kind of get excerpted on social media and turned into something. Ins I mean, literally, and then there was like headline after headline of like, you know, the filmmakers are saying you're climate deniers if you don't like our movie. And at first I was like laughing at it and then I was like, I feel like we're, I'm in the movie. <laughs> like, I don't even know how to, and, and the more you, you try to debunk, the that's what you, then you're creating more controversy. I, I mean, I should have known that from having worked on, uh, you know, campaigns. So, so that's a long way of telling you what I was surprised at. I think the, uh, very quickly, the, you know, what were the critics, um, what, what point um, did they have? I mean, I thought it was an interesting point. I saw some criticism that, that, and it sort of falls into the, it wasn't a perfect metaphor, but I think there was something to it, which is that um, in the movie, 
the president really does have the singular sole instant authority to stop the crisis. And I think when it comes to climate, I think the president has a ton of power to put in place the policies that begin mitigating the crisis. But I think that, you know, that is fundamentally different. Um, but that said, so I thought that, that that's like a fair point. That said, I think like when we look at what Joe Biden is doing right now, I think I also sometimes feel like we're in the movie. It's a president who goes out and says the right things about the proverbial comet and then doesn't expect anyone to follow up and see that he's doing the exact wrong things to stop the comet. I wanted to ask you about that in, in just the two minutes we have left about solutions. Like, it's just, the movie itself is, oh, well, I guess there's a big solution at the end, but uh, what would have fixed that world, uh, or if you draw a distinction between that and our, and our own? Uh, I think what it would have fixed that would be, um, first, a media system that takes the crisis seriously, stops focusing on distracting people. Let me tell you about <laughs> Bloomberg Green. <laughs> stop, stop focusing on distracting people. Stop focusing on comforting everybody all the time, like, hey, everything's going to be OK. You just put your head down and, and don't pay attention. That, in theory, would have created more political pressure to actually seriously deal with the crisis. There was a delay at the beginning, and then obviously there was a choice at the end. So I think that's, those are two things. Um, I think also underneath this ideology that every crisis can be an opportunity to profit and that every crisis presents a chance to be a win for billionaires and corporations and also uh, the rest of the, of the world, I think that ideology is eating away at our society, that there are zero-sum choices that you have to, in many cases, make a choice. Somebody wins, somebody loses. The fossil fuel industry wins, we all lose. There is no middle ground with the fossil fuel industry continuing to make huge profits and the world surviving in the way that it is today. And politicians who take lots of money from fossil fuel companies, and in my view, media companies that take lots of money from fossil fuel companies, do not want to admit that because that would then have to admit the truth that somebody is going to have to win and lose. There is no win-win solution for everybody. And so I think if that ideology didn't exist in the movie with, through that Mark Rylance character, I think the argument would be that the government would have gone through with what it should have got, done to stop that crisis earlier on. Hmm. What, uh, what is next for David Sirota? Tell us about The Lever and uh, in your next movie. Uh, so The Lever at Lever News, for folks who are watching, it's our independent media outlet. We do investigative journalism, follow the money, uh, and we don't always accept that there are win-win solutions. There are good guys and bad guys. So if you like that kind of reporting, uh, check us out. Um, I've got a couple scripts and projects that are out there that deal with politics uh, and um, uh, in a kind of narrative fashion. And the, the last thing I'll say very quickly is, you know, one thing that I've learned is that the power of storytelling in this is just so important that, that part of the reason why it's important to have cultural products that tell a story of characters is because that's humans through thousands of years have, have learned to learn things through those stories. So I'm trying to think more about how to mix sort of journalism and important public you know, a accountability efforts with storytelling. Excellent. Well, we look forward to, uh, to your next moves. Thank you.